Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. All right, I'm here with Lucas Jopa from Microsoft Research. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure, I'm a, um, I'm a scientist in Microsoft Research, but in particular, I'm a, a scientist in a group called Computational Ecology and Environmental Science, um, which is a group based in the, in the Cambridge, UK um, research lab. And, uh, and so that's a job title that probably most people watching uh, this video um, have, have never heard of before. The fact that Microsoft actually has a group of, of computational ecologists um, in doing um, peer, peer research. And what exactly is a computational ecologist? Sure, so, so I, I would like to um, simply be able to say a computational ecologist is just an ecologist, but it's probably more truthful to say that it's a bit more of a, an ecologist of, of the future. Traditionally, it's really been a, a science dominated by natural history, right? People going out into the wild, into the woods, and, and observing things for a long time, and, and coming up with observations and hypotheses, and, and then trying to bring those into an experimental setting and testing them to, to prove or disprove their hypothesis. Um, but as, as the interest in the environment has has scaled up and as the realization that um that everything is connected at, at scales larger than just maybe um you know the the woods behind your house um we've had to really scale up our thinking and and to do that we have to say okay let's start looking at things from a global perspective at high resolutions and let's try and take all of these data that are coming in from from sensors and 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 scientists and and lab notebooks and all this kind of stuff and put it together well you know you're just not going to do that at the whiteboard anymore um you you need really strong um computational methods and you really and um and c computational um workflows so how did you get involved in this field? I know that you you said once that you took a class um, on extinction that really uh, motivated you. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, sure. So my background is is probably quite different than um, most people um, sitting in in Microsoft Research. Uh, I come from from the woods of far northern Wisconsin, thirty miles from a stoplight, um, running around and in, in outside as much as I could, uh, avoiding school as as much as I could, and. Um, and I was not a computationally minded person um, whatsoever. I was, um, I was, I was anything but. I didn't have my first computer until um, sometime during my undergraduate years. We never had one in the house. We never had a TV in the house. Um, and and so, uh, I came to computational ecology and computational methods through um, as a as a side product of of my passion, which is trying to figure out how to conserve ecological systems. So, like you said, I was I was an undergraduate at the University of Wisconsin Madison. I was studying um, studying. Well, I didn't know what I was studying to be honest. Like like most undergrads, and as part of my general education requirements, I I needed to take a course in the zoology department. I stumbled upon one called Extinction of Species, which I thought sounded interesting, and um, I sat there for the first forty five minute lecture, and um, I'd never heard somebody talk about something in school um, that was so so um, close to to what I found to be important for what I could see as kind of a life mission I went up uh, after that class I said how do I do this basically um, I'm not I, th I think I, I took the the professor by surprise a little bit um, but we were friends today and uh, he got started me down a process of, um, of of studying wildlife ecology and zoology a two-year stint um, in Malawi in the Peace Corps working for their Department of National Parks and, and Wildlife and then a PhD in, in ecology uh, at Duke University's Nicholas School of Environment. And then what led you to Microsoft Research? So Microsoft Research was a, a bit of serendipity, a bit of luck, and a bit of hard work and preparation, I think. Um, I never, I never um, would have sat down you know, 10 years ago and said, my goal is, is to um, be a computational ecologist at Microsoft Research, although I hope that um, within a few years that, that were were recognizable enough that people in in undergraduate institutions might have that goal. Um, I think I think that that would be a, a fantastic thing to 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 see happen. 
but um, but I had spent a lot of my time working on um, ecological networks, so standard graph theory sorts of questions, because what I was really interested in is what if one of those nodes in a network is a species, right? And what if um, the, the, the edges between those nodes were interactions, maybe feeding interactions? And so we call those things food webs, or, or, or um, we used to call them food webs, now we call them ecological um, networks. But, but I was really interested in what happens if I take one of those nodes out? And what's the model that um, describes how the you know the interactions flow across the network, and what's the end result of that? Because that that that's a species extinction, right? And and that goes right back to that undergraduate course that that I took. So I was really interested in those methods. Um, the computational ecology group was at that time run by um, one of the foremost experts in the world, um, a guy named Rich Williams, an expert in ecological networks. He'd um, He's a fantastic guy. He'd helped set up our group. And I got in touch with him. Um, our research interests really clicked. And, uh, and I went, you know, in the standard interview process. The, and uh, I met all the people in the computational ecology group. And it really just felt like, you know, this is the place, kind of. This is, these, are my, these are my kind of intellectual kin, as it, as it were. And, uh, and I've been there ever since. And what's the value that computer science gives to uh, environmental sciences? You know, we just can't handle, first of all, and this is kind of boring, but it's pragmatic. We just can't handle the, the amounts of data that are flowing at us anymore um, without, without embracing um, computer science and computational methods. But it's also becoming extremely difficult to, to derive information from those data without computational methods. So if I've got some sort of model with, with you know, multiple parameters and, and different data sets and, and I want to have some sort of hierarchical model structure and, and all of this kind of stuff, and, and, and so at the end of the day, you know, I've got a model, I've got some data, and, and in a Bayesian framework, I want to confront that model with those data to how do I do that, right? I mean, I can I can write that out. I can I can describe the algorithm to you um, uh, in conversation. I could write it on the board, whatever. But the methods to estimate the parameters in the model, I I, I need my computer to to do that. Um, and that's just one small example. Um, Are there any uh, major tipping points in your intersection of environmental and computer science that are leading to rapid advancements or realizations? What can you what can you glean from all this information? Yeah, so so I think the tipping point that we're at now uh, there's there's two really interesting things there. The first is this this merging of of hardware and software. I think uh, I've never been so excited to to think about technology as as I am now. Um, the idea that um, hardware is no longer immutable. Uh, you can change it to, to meet your changing needs. I mean, um, the, a project I had nothing to do with, but um, I'm, I'm hugely uh, excited about is something that came out of Microsoft Research called .NET Gadgeteer, which is this plug and play, um, build your own um, hardware device. And, and we're using those in our group quite a bit to build these one-off bespoke environmental monitoring systems. Um, and, and you know, you can write some simple code and put together some simple hardware and suddenly you have something that's not so simple. You have a fairly sophisticated environmental monitoring device. And, and the, the fact that, that software is becoming much easier to work with, right? 20 years ago, you, you, you kind of needed to be a computer scientist to, to, um, to really truly embrace computational methods. And now, now um, people like, like me can, can uh, take those things and go charging forward with, in, our, in our own um, research domains. So, so that's one, one area. Um, and the other area is um, just this, this um, ubiquitous computing kind of, 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 of things, you know. Uh, um, we keep talking about ubiquitous computing as if it's something of the future. Um, as if we aren't all walking around with smartphones in our pockets and tablets on our desks and, you know, and, and, um, and, and refrigerators that, that know when to, to, to cool down and, and when not to. I mean, ubiquitous computing is, is, is occurring right now. It will, computing will become even more ubiquitous, but, um, but it's already going on. And, and through things like crowdsourcing, um, trying to 
figure out um, what's going on in the natural world, it's never been easier, right? I can quickly engage legions of motivated individuals to go out and do things that they really want to do and feel passionate about contributing something back. And so um, things like uh, just simply trying to figure out where species are, right? Um, I can marry up um, machine learning style models and methods like like active learning and I can say okay I've got only a few data points about this species I've got some rough and ready model that kind of it describes its distribution across maybe the state of Washington according to some environmental variables like temperature and precipitation but then using um, you know statistical computational methods I can say well what's the next most important data point that I need right and I can then engage with community, active communities of, of people and I can say, hey, you, you know, you're the best person to go and get me this information, bring it back, you know, and, and uh, yeah, it, these aren't ideas that people haven't had before. It's just that everything's now available. Um, you know, crowdsourcing and citizen science is, is, is accepted. Um, we, we are all running around with, with some sort of connected devices, whether they be tablets or smartphones, and and um, and the and the the machine learning and and AI techniques are coming along as well, and and it's really just creating this exciting time, even for an environmental scientist. So let's talk a little bit about that. Tell me about the role that machine learning and AI play in your work. Sure. So I gave you a, a brief example um, in in one of your previous questions, um, uh, talking about species distribution modeling and and harnessing the power of the crowd to to answer some of this stuff. But we actually had a paper um, just a few months back in the journal Science using some some standard AI. Um, AI techniques to answer a question of international conservation importance. And um, it's interesting because I, I just try to use whatever computational methods I need to answer the questions that, that I'm interested in. And, and it wasn't until I saw a, uh, um, a news story saying AI for conservation that I realized, oh yeah, this, these, these techniques actually, are, you know, that's the intellectual heritage here. But, um, but um, so in this instance, we we're trying to ask um, a question, which is simply there's there's a there's a convention called the Convention on Biological Diversity, which is um, a, a convention signed by over 200 countries um, agreeing to halt the loss of, of biodiversity by by 2020, by the year 2020. And one of their goals is to set aside 17 percent of of land in protected areas. And that's an area that I work, have worked a lot on in, in my time. How effective are protected areas? Where should you put them, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but they have another goal, which is to protect 60% of plant species within protected areas by, by the year 2020. So nobody had ever asked that obvious question, which is, well, is that even possible? Can you, you know, protect 60% of plant species within 70% of the land area? Can you cram 60% of all plant species within such a small amount of area? So I wanted to ask that question. I wanted to ask that question about not just 17% of land area. I wanted to ask it about 7% and 8% and 28% and 38%. How many species can I cram into 28% of the land, 17%? And I wanted to build these nice accumulation curves and, and see how biodiversity really is distributed um, across, across the planet. And what do you turn to for that? You turn to greedy algorithms and genetic algorithms. And so we used greedy algorithms to try and build up iteratively, you know, step by step, the, the, the optimal accumulation curve. And then we said, well, is our greedy algorithm actually optimal? And we turned to very classic AI techniques like, like genetic algorithms. And we said, okay, well, let's use these strongly computational methods to, to ask at 17% of the land, how, what are the ways that we would pick the regions of the world apart and, and put them back together to maximize the total number of species in, in the least amount of area? So that's just one example of, um, of machine learning or AI techniques that are actually kind of, you know, scaling up in relevance to, to international, you know, biological treaties between countries. And I find that stuff really exciting. So typically when we talk about sensors, we're talking about uh, sensors in a device or even sensors in a data center where, where there's a power strip and there's networking. You're talking about uh, sensors in remote locations. What are your challenges around that? Yeah, so uh, so I think this saying gets repeated in all sorts of domains, but I um, 
when I'm not at work, I've, I've well, my whole life has, has been um, uh, kind of dedicated to work and, and to racing bikes. And, and in bike racing, right, we, we have the saying, um, strong, light, and cheap, pick two, you know? And, um, and the same kind of um, goes with, with devices, you know? Um, uh, I don't know, uh, power efficient, <laughs> you know, yeah. robust and, and cheap, you know, pick two. And, uh, and, and the problem is when you're working out in remote locations with resource constrained organizations and, and initiatives, you don't have the privilege of picking two. You need all three. You need devices that are power efficient, that are connected, um, and are robust to to anything you know nature throws at them. And so we've been working on on trying to solve some of those those problems. I think one of the most interesting things that we've been doing is um, designing these bespoke um, GPS tracking devices, um, which which are called Mataki. Um, if you go to mataki.org, you can you can find out more about them. Um, and and they also set up a radio mesh network amongst all of the um, the devices that are on animals out out in the field. And so if if I'm wearing one of the devices and you are, you know, we're constantly downloading information from satellites about our location, and then we're also passing our information back and forth. So um, you kind of saturate the network that way so that you really only have to come into contact with one of those devices to get the network worth of information. But we're also doing things like working with um, unmanned aerial vehicles to operate as roaming base stations. So you can imagine a um, uh, a UAV flying around listening to, to, to these devices, right? And when it hears one, it flies over and downloads its information. And what's even uh, kind of more incredible is it can, you know, you can say right now, have its autopilot uh, software lock on to, to that device for the next five minutes and fly around, turn on your high definition cameras, bring all of that rich information back. And what that allows you to do is it allows you to marry up the kind of the, the coarse GPS, you know, information that you're getting about how an animal moves through its environment with that really highly detailed contextualized information for five minutes about what's going on, what's the landscape look like, what are the an other animals around it, what's it actually doing, and um, and and that's fantastic stuff. And it and it's it's causing us to think well, not not how would we model those data, or well, not what models would we use. It's more. What models can we come up with now? Because we never even thought that we would have that kind of information. So, um, so it's, it's an exciting time. What are some of the unlikely collaborations that have come from your research efforts? Sure. So all sorts. Um, I mean, just really briefly, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a real one. But, um, but just the other day, an engineer who works for me was, um, was busy stuffing one of these Mataki devices in a rat as it was being fed to a uh, to a crocodile. Um, so uh, so so that's some you know strange stuff because they're trying to tag crocodiles, and one way to um, to do that is to to put one in its stomach. So you know you're watching that, and you're just kind of like, how, what is going on right now? You know, I mean, uh, but but no, the 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 serious answer to to that question is is um, a collaboration that I'm actually really really proud of. Um, that's last year, there's an organization called the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, the IUCN. It's the world's largest and oldest um, conservation organization, and um, it operates very much at the international level as an umbrella organization across governments and, and banks, international banks and, and um, conservation NGOs. And they put out something called the Red List, which is if you've ever picked up the newspaper and read 25% of plants are threatened with extinction or something like that, that's coming from the Red List. It's, I think I'm safe to say it is the single most important data set on conservation. It's the result of over um, you know, 10,000 scientists across the world uploading information about, about the species that they know about and their conservation status. Um, so that's been going on for a long time. And, and last year, Microsoft was invited um, to come on board as the 10th partner to the Red List. We were the first corporation to, to be asked. Um, and, and what was really gratifying about that is that we actually weren't asked because we're a corporation. Sure, yeah, I, 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 the fact that we are Microsoft is, is fantastic for, for both parties, I think, for um, the resources that can be potentially mobilized. But the reason that we were asked is because we are the computational ecology group with the skills, the education, and I would like to think the passion to, um, to really drive some of this stuff, this stuff forward. And so um, it's the 50th anniversary of, of the Red List next year, and I'm really excited that Microsoft's gonna be able to be part of um, 
part of that celebration and part of that thinking about what the next 50 years are going to look like. How has the use of spatial data changed the way scientists do uh, computational environmental work? Yeah, I think, so spatial data is interesting because... Um, Explain what spatial data is for someone who might not know. Yeah, so spatial data, it's, um, it's information on, on locations, right? X, Y um, coordinates. And, and what's, what's interesting is outside of environmental science, the way spatial data is often treated is, is in, in my mind, two kind of um, simplistic ways. One, we like to turn spatial information into grids, right? Um, so if you go on big maps and you, and you zoom in and out, you're looking at spatial information. Ecologists use spatial data probably more than any other domain because we're interested in where animals move, the spatial context of, of, um, of where they're doing, um, whatever they're doing, and, and trying to bundle that all together and, and explicitly including that in our, in our models as well. We're interested in figuring out how you, how you use spatial data in a much richer way um, than, than has traditionally been kind of uh, taken up before. And, and that's allowing us to push things uh, like our own company's products, um, the, the fantastic geospatial capacity of SQL Server, for example, that thousands of probably tens of thousands or more, I don't know, um, I'm terrible with business numbers, but you know, a lot of, of people and, in, in the enterprise world are using these, these, these functions. Um, we're, trying to, we're trying to do science now that I think um, is using these products in the way that enterprise will want to use them 10 years from now. And, and I always find that to be a pretty strong rationale for myself about, about our utility here. Um, so anyway, that's just a long drawn out answer to a simple question. But. What's, a, what's the holy grail for this work? What, what is one of the things that you'd like to see happen in your lifetime or in uh, the length of your career? Yeah, sure. I mean, the holy grail is is probably the um, the the holy grail of of most scientific disciplines. I mean, we're interested in t in finding out as much information as we possibly can about what happened in the past, collecting as much information about what's going on right now, and being able to put all of that together and to to try and figure out what's going to happen into the future. So my holy grail would be, um, you know, that you could go to a mapping service, preferably Microsoft's, and and zoom in and. And, and start asking questions about what's there in this place, what's there and what used to be there and what's going to be there. And you know, what, what's the vegetation there? If it's agriculture, what's the crop? What's the projected crop yield? Um, what's the projected crop yield under climate change scenarios? Um, all of that kind of information I think is, 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 wildly useful, wildly important, and, and, uh, and there's also a significant um, uh, business rationale there. I mean, I, before I came to Microsoft, I, um, I had started up a company called Earth Audit, which was all about providing predictive information about the planet, finding out that uh, I could do the same thing, but for one of the world's um, most interesting and um, important technology companies was a no-brainer for me, so, so over I came. But, um, but it shouldn't come as any surprise then that, that my holy grail is, is about um, predictive information about the planet. It, it, we need it. Societies need it. Governments need it. Businesses need it. Individuals need it. Uh, I, I see it coming. Um, so, uh, so, so that's my holy grail. Um, but, but there's a long way to go. And what's next? What are some of the things on the horizon that you see? One of the things that I think has a lot of legs is is an initiative that we've started up um, called Technology for Nature, um, and it really is um, about trying to use technology to rapidly scale up um, the global response to biodiversity loss, which which sounds kind of like a mouthful, but um, it it encompasses or incorporates a lot of the things that that we've been talking about about today. Um, it, it focuses really um, strongly on, on devices and algorithms and software and, and um, interacting with, with conservation organizations and, 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 and other, um, other partners. And the reason that I think um, it's so exciting, and one of the reasons that I'm so excited to work at a place like Microsoft and Microsoft Research is, I come to work every day and it's impossible for me to ignore that I work with a group of some of the smartest, most dedicated, passionate people 
in the world working on all sorts of things that I do not work on, <laughs> um, that I don't want to work on, um, that maybe intellectually I'm incapable of working on. Um, but for nearly every one of those things, I can imagine how it would be enormously useful for studying and helping to conserve ecological systems. And so um, technology for nature is, is a bit of an umbrella term. Um, it's, it, it talks about, or it, it represents a research agenda within um, our group, but it also represents a, a collaboration between the Zoological Society of London and the University of College of London. All three of our organizations are really, um, are really motivated to, to try and leverage all of the fantastic work that's going on out there. I mean, it's, there's, there's so much more to do than, than I can do and then the, the people in the team that I work in can do. I have a personal passion for, for conserving, uh, conserving Earth's natural systems and, and so technology for nature, I think, really marries those two, those two passions up quite well. And I'm excited about, about the next year. I think it'll be great. Thanks for talking to us today. Always a pleasure.